Hello and welcome to another edition of Community Forum. My name is Joseph Feaster and I'm the host of the program and I want to wish all of our viewing audience a happy new year. There's been no time in my life when the presidency of the United States was so much in discussion. It's almost 24-7. We're hearing something about what's going on in Washington around the president administration and as I refer to the president as number 45 and we'll talk more about that with my guests as we go on. But what we want to talk about today is to give you a history of the presidency, looking at it from the, from the lens of our founding fathers as they developed the Constitution and they put in Section uh, 3 of the, of the Cons Article 3 of the Constitution talking about the presidency and what the roles are, Article 1, which talked about the legislature, and so we, and I think that I think that Article Two was the Senate. I'll get our definitely our education from my guests on those particular points. We also want to talk about we had rogues amongst the forty-five. We had some shining stars amongst the forty-five. And then lastly, I want to talk about so people will understand what is this whole discussion about presidential pardon, presidential privilege. Um, and all of those types of issues which are currently being bantered around in the media most recently. I am pleased and honored to have a dear friend, a professor who was at Northeastern University when I was a student there, became a good friend of mine over the course of those many, many decades. And I wanted to have him here because he is intelligent, <laughs> he is wise, he is knowledgeable, and he definitely will give you a discourse relative to the presidency of the United States. I want you to join me in welcoming my guest, William M. Fowler, Jr. Well, thank you, Joe. I, <coughs> I don't know if those words are true, but they're certainly kind. So thank you. Well, in terms of I am going to say, as I tell folks, this is my show. I'm going to say <laughs> well, all the good things about it because they are definitely the truth. But well, I, I'm delighted to be here. But let me just give, I just want to give, I, I, it, I would be remiss if I didn't put it in context because I okay. want to be able to let folks know, that, as I know you, how scholarly and studied you are on this particular subject. You, you've been... You are uh, the uh, Distinguished Professor of History Emeritus at Northeastern University. You were the former director of the Massachusetts Historical Society. Uh, you are a, as I am, a Northeastern yes, University indeed. grad <laughs> and, uh, and you know, from which you received your undergraduate degree and then went on to Notre Dame for your PhD. You, have, you are prolific as an author. You've done a number of different books. And it was interesting, I was reading, a lot of them have to do with folks who are in the water, the Navy and yes, the indeed. seamanship <laughs> is indeed, a large do. part of what you've done. Right. But of course, you've also covered the, uh, the presidency. And I see that you, were, you did an in, in introduction and epilogue for a book that was on Boston Looks Seaward. And you co-authored one which is called America in the Sea, A Maritime History yes. of America. Uh, and at Northeastern, you taught a multiplicity of courses, but the one I'm focusing on is American history mm -hmm. and American colonial, colonial and revolutionary history. And you also uh, taught at other universities, George Washington's uh, um, Mount Vernon Mystic Seaport Museum and lectured at the Smithsonian and in a off air we were talking about you now lecturing on cruise ships. Yes uh, indeed. Do you need anybody to carry your luggage when you go on these things? Well I'll uh, think professor? about that. I'll have okay. to consult with my wife. Okay well in terms of that's <laughs> great. Let's get to the sure. subject matter and, I, and you know I, as, as we had talked about what we might want to cover for years and right. I, one of the things I like to do on, on this uh, program is to educate our viewing audience. Mm -hmm. If you could just take us through what our founding fathers had in mind with respect to the relationship in the executive branch in terms of the presidency, in terms of the legislative branch, and the, and the relationship with the judicial branch, how they foresaw from your vantage point and from your study of history so that people understand better how things may look relative to what's going on now. Joe, the founding fathers who created this republic were all veterans of the American Revolution. Uh, they had lived through an extraordinary period in history. Uh, they had either participated in the revolution as soldiers or politicians, or they had watched it. So everything that they did in creating this new republic was based upon experience. 
In fact, one of the members of the Constitutional Convention uh, remarked to his colleagues, he said, experience must be our only guide for reason may mislead us. And by that, what he meant was that they were there in Philadelphia to devise a practical document that could govern this republic. They didn't want to hear about theory. They didn't need any political scientists there. They wanted to out of their own experience. And that's what the Constitution is. It's a document written from experience. And what they needed to do, a fundamental point that they did agree upon. Uh, in the 18th century, uh, political philosophers used to remark uh, that, uh, a, uh, that power was like a lion and that the lion's natural prey was liberty. So they feared political power. They wanted to control political power. And so they created a system, which we have today, of the division of powers, balance of power, separation of powers. So that was one of the fundamental concepts, that these three branches of government should be equal and a check upon each other. Now, when it came to the presidency, that was a matter of great discussion. And I stated it wrong because it's really uh, uh, Article 2. Right. Uh, uh, section, let me see, Article, yes, Article yeah, 2, right. Section 1. It's interesting, Joe, yes. because you mentioned the articles, and you might point out that Article 1 is the legislature. That's correct. Article 2 is the president. Article 3 is the judiciary. Now, I don't want to impute any intent on the part of the Founding Fathers, but I do think it is quite clear that they saw the legislature, the Congress, as the most important, perhaps, element of this government. And so there they created this system of balance. Now, the presidency was a particular problem because they did fear executive power. They had seen it in George III. Uh, and so they needed to craft this position very carefully, and they did. Uh, with lots of checks upon the president. They also crafted a way which I think very few Americans, even today, Joe, in, uh, in the 21st century, they crafted a system to elect a president, which was very convoluted, remains convoluted. <laughs> but that was their intention. That wasn't a mistake. That was their intention. So when they did, the, in terms of the popular vote, as well as in terms of uh, having the Electoral College, that was purposeful. Right. They did not want a president elected by popular vote because they were concerned that the populace could be swayed in a variety of different directions. So they wanted a series of layers that would ensure that the president would emerge from a group of well-qualified men in, in kind of a, a, a sifting process, and that what would emerge from this sifting process, called the Electoral College, was, would be the very best person. Uh, not necessarily the person with the most popular votes. That was not their intent at all, but to control this person. One of the uh, conundrums that they had was about the election of the president. Should the president uh, be restricted in the number of terms that he could serve? They couldn't decide. They simply couldn't decide. So they did what they did in many other parts of the Constitution. They simply left it vague uh, with the assumption that future generations will have to face this issue and they will have to deal with it. Uh, one of the things about these men in Philadelphia, as proud and sometimes as arrogant as they were, <laughs> there was also a certain humility to them. They knew they couldn't predict the future. Uh, they really did believe they were doing the best job they could and it would be up to generations to come to fix their mistakes and change the document. And that they did. And that they and did. And that's where we got with the amendments exactly to, the, right. uh, to, to the Constitution. It's interesting because just like I, uh, you know, and, and you know, the lawyer in me says, go back to the facts and read. So I brought along the Constitution mm -hmm. so I could be. And in glancing at it, I still made uh, some foibles as to the specific ones. Uh, but your explanation of the intent is so telling because if we, you know, if we jump ahead into the future and to now, we're seeing this playing played yes. out in both the election that took place this uh, last year and which was one of the few times when it was an electoral college vote. And now you can correct me mm -hmm. if I'm wrong, but among the 45, I don't know if that ever occurred with it, with the electoral college or has that occurred oh, in yes. the past before? <laughs> We've actually had, in terms of popular vote, minority presidents several times. Perhaps the most uh, famous would be Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, did not have, uh, far from it, a majority of the vote, uh, but he carried the northern states, 
with the mass of electoral votes. Uh, John Kennedy, 1960, did not actually win the popular vote. He had less than 50 percent. So it's not unusual for a president to have less than 50 percent, less than a majority of the popular vote, but because of the system, the electoral college is what really counts, and there the majority rules. Now, one of the things that I talked about, I mean, as I described it in my intro, I said we had the rogues, and we had the scholars, yeah, yes, indeed. and we had, <laughs> yeah. a, uh, you know, and again, that may be left from a historical interpretation, yeah. and you would know better than I who may categorize. I remember I, I looked, I went and did research on it. I'm not going to, I'm not the scholar here, so I don't want to be able to make those types of representations. Yeah. But I do know this, and we talked about this off air as well, that there were only, uh, there's only been two instances uh, when we've had the issue of impeachment yes. come up. Yes, <clears throat> that is true. Can we talk about that? Uh, the two presidents, and by the way, the impeachment process, again, like the Electoral College, uh, I think is sometimes misunderstood. Uh, the way that it works is that it, a bill of impeachment, a normal piece of legislation, is introduced into the House of Representatives, <clears throat> sent to a committee, usually the Judiciary Committee, and then the House votes. It's, again, like legislation. If a majority approves of the bill, it then goes to the Senate. And then the Senate sits at, in a trial, and the Senate sits as a jury. So. Two presidents have actually been impeached. They have not been convicted because the bill passed in the House, but they failed to get a conviction in the Senate. And those two presidents who were impeached by the House, Andrew Johnson, who was Abraham Lincoln's successor, uh, Johnson was impeached on the charge that he had violated the Tenure of Office Act, uh, which the Tenure of Office Act said that for a president to uh, dismiss a cabinet officer, he needed the approval of the Senate. Uh, and Johnson dismissed the cabinet officer without the approval of the Senate, and so he's brought up on charges, impeached. In the trial in the Senate, the vote for conviction failed by one vote, so Johnson continued his term. I might add, by the way, as a footnote, that the Tenure of Office Act, upon which he was charged violating, was later declared unconstitutional <laughs> by the court. Okay. The second president to be impeached was uh, President Clinton. Uh, and he was impeached, the bill of impeachment passed in the House, uh, but it failed in the Senate again. So we have never had a president convicted. We have never re removed a president uh, by impeachment. Uh, president Nixon did leave, uh, but that's only because I think he probably saw it was time to get out of Dodge. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that the likelihood of actually being impeached and convicted was probably pretty high, so he resigned. Uh, but we have never forced a president out through an impeachment process. Let's talk a little about, I mean, in a lot of the literature that I read in preparation to have this conversation with you was, was talking exactly about that balance of power and mm -hmm. the interesting part, uh, and you mentioned it here, about the fact that the founding fathers, at least if not explicitly, implicitly indicated that the body with a number of people, the legislature, mm -hmm. was almost going to be primo uh, uno uh, in, with regards to this new confederacy that they were bringing together. Can you talk a little bit more about that as, as, you know, from your, because I'm sure you've had these discussions in all of your classes at one point in time. Yes, indeed. Uh, the center of power, my interpretation, I, other historians might disagree, but the center of power as far as the founding fathers saw it was indeed in the Congress. Uh, the Congress represented the states. The Congress represented the people. Okay. And the Congress was the place from which legislation always comes. Uh, for example, in cases of taxation, all tax, tax bills must originate in the House because the House, elected every two years, is the closest to the people. So the House was intended to be the voice of the people. The Senate, on the other hand, in a kind of a Roman-like tradition, and the Senate, of course, elected for six years. As they called the upper body. The upper body. <laughs> and, in fact, in the original Constitution, before an amendment, uh, the Senate was elected not by the people. The Senate, the two senators from each state, were elected by the state legislature. So there again we have this insulation from the voice of the people. So the Senate was intended to be a more deliberative body which I su would suggest over the generations has in fact proven to be true. So again, we have this division of power even within the legislature. 
the House close to the people, feeling the pulse of the people, up for re-election every two years. The Senate, elected by state legislatures, and the senators sit for six years, somewhat insulated from the daily routine, the pressures, the winds of change. They could be more deliberative. The interesting part, uh, you know, again, and you know, I, I was a political science mm -hmm. major there. Of course, I had to take history courses also, uh, but not in the depth that uh, that certainly uh, of the knowledge that you have. I, 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 in my instructive way to our viewing audience, I would let's go, but we're going to go back in mm -hmm. that time right. machine, and we're going to sit there with the, uh, you know. Uh, with the Hamiltons, uh, and we're going to sit there uh, with Ben Franklin, and we're going to sit there with it. Did does any of your your studies talk about the players and where they came out on it? Because I'm seeing a dichotomy uh -huh. between the people piece and some still hearkening for what was done over in England with the British form of government. And it seemed like that may have been the conflict that was taking place as they sat around those tables. There was always that conflict, Joe. There are the tension between democracy and aristocracy. Uh, and despite our problems with King George III, the fact of the matter was that most Americans at the time admired the British system of government. It was a parliamentary system that perhaps had gone awry to be sure, and it precipitated a revolution. But nonetheless, that in its very fundamental sense, it was a rule of law and a representative House of Commons body with an executive, the king, at the top. And so there were some, the, prime, the primary person who advocated this position, Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton was very much in favor of a very strong executive, very strong executive. He was also inclined to uh, want to limit the power of the states. What Hamilton saw on the English model was a very powerful central government uh, and that the states would be quite subservient to that government. He also viewed the president as not a titular head because the president has real power, uh, but he's, in a sense he saw the president as a symbolic figure and in his judgment and not coincidentally, by the way, he was Secretary of the Treasury, he saw the Secretary of the Treasury to be sort of the Prime Minister, the first among equals in the Cabinet, because the Secretary of the Treasury was in charge of finances. Right. And so Hamilton's view then... I think was, Hamilton was a New Yorker. Oh, too. he was a New Yorker, <laughs> yes. So Hamilton's view uh, was very hierarchical yes. uh, with the Secretary of the Treasury himself uh, playing this role as the go-between between between the head of state, the president, and the legislature. Well, of course, thank heavens we had George Washington, because Washington would have none of this. And Washington exerted great control and great influence, and he was a force to be reckoned with. And so Washington then set the tone and set the traditions uh, for the presidency. He did not work through the Secretary of the Treasury to the legislature. He worked to the legislature directly. And he exerted the powers of the presidency in a fashion that only he could. Uh, so Hamilton's view, and the view of people like him, of this hierarchical, somewhat arist aristocratic structure, imitation of the British system, did not come to fruition. And instead, we evolved into the system we have today with a president, a very powerful president, uh, two houses of the legislature, and a judiciary. Hopefully, a balancing and indeed, when necessary, challenging one another. One of the things that I know, and I, I, I mentioned the New York piece, not only because the, uh, our current pres uh, President 45 is a New Yorker, but more from the standpoint of, again, when you start talking about the discourse and the tensions that took place, I know because I learned this through the course of study that there was some discussion about the Capitol being in New York, which yes. would have been where Hamilton was, yes, yes. and it wound up in yes. D.C. <clears throat> Can you enlighten folks on, on, on what was that conversation that resulted in the Capitol being in Washington, D.C., rather than, uh, or I guess, Upper Virginia at that particular point in time? <laughs> well, Joe, this was an unusual period in our history when compromise uh, was acceptable. Uh, there was in the Congress a great debate over what was called funding and assumption. Uh, the question was all of these debts left over from the American Revolution, the new republic is now in place. Uh, how should these debts be treated? Uh, 
there were some who argued that many of the uh, debts, let's call them IOUs, that had been issued during the revolution had, in the course of time, been sold and sold and resold. Uh, so if you had loaned the government $100 and the government gave you an IOU for $100, the government's reputation during the revolution was not very good. So you might sell it for $50, and then the person to whom you sold it for $50 might then sell it for $25, etc. as the value went down. And there were some now who argued that the federal government should assume those debts, but that they should not pay the full value. Because if I showed up with a IOU for $100, for which I had only paid $25, I was entitled to $25, not $100. That was pure speculation. The other side, and this was the side of Alexander Hamilton, Hamilton argued the full faith and credit of the United States demanded that the government pay what that document said. And so uh, the South, particularly the South, argued against paying the full value. Hamilton and many in the North argued for paying the full value. As this debate was going on, and it was a vigorous debate, arose the question of the location of the capital. Where will the capital be? There is a wonderful story told, perhaps partly apocryphal, but maybe not necessarily, of a dinner. A dinner that Thomas Jefferson arranged between Alexander Hamilton okay, and James Monroe. Two sides of the question. At this dinner, they struck an agreement. Monroe said he would not necessarily support Hamilton's position in the Congress, but he would not oppose it. And in return, Hamilton and his allies had to agree that the capital of the United States would be located in the South, in a specially designated district that would be carved out of the states of Maryland and Virginia creating the District of Columbia. The deal was made. The government assumed the debts and paid the debts at their full value. And the capital, of course, was established in Washington, D.C. Established and remains. Established and remains in Washington, D.C. Uh, one little footnote to that. It was very important to everyone that wherever the capital was, it could not be in a state because they feared that if it was a city within a state, that it would be under pressure, could come under pressure from the state government. Mm -hmm. And so they wanted to be sure that the capital would be an independent entity, not subservient to any state. And that's why they created the District of Columbia. Interesting, because as, as now, as much as I do a lot of lobbying from time to time at Capitol Hill, and you start to think about that, and you hear the discussions about folks in D.C., they, will, they now have a representative uh, for the district, but in terms yeah. of having uh, not being, now the argument is we're not being treated like the state, we're not being funded like the state, right. we are something else. So it's interesting to hear that some of the thinking uh, that was uh, in play at the time when it was created and what it has become yes. and the conversation yes. now yes. with yes. respect to yes. that. Yes. And, uh, I might mention, by the way, I said Monroe, I meant Madison. Was Madison, James Madison, Madison had the yeah, dinner. Yeah, yes, yes. James, yeah. he was our uh, which president well, was he? Well, he's, he's, he's uh, Madison's president during the War of eighteen twelve. That's right. You know, so I, I want to talk about that. I was going to come yeah. go, come to the future, but I want to hmm. walk folks through sure. a little bit of history. Let's talk about some of the forty five. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I know that there are the stories, and you can pick the ones that you want to tell. Uh, like I said, I've done the the reading I got was just to get the list of who they are, so right. I can at least have some indication and some knowledge of if one asks yeah. me in terms, I can now say, well, Madison was the fourth <laughs> president, right. and, and so, sound sound yeah. very intelligent right. on air, and uh, you know, and but there were some, there were some. Outstanding persons, ones that were viewed as outstanding oh, yes, and made yes, contributions. Yes, yes. There were some that were very, you know, there was one president that lasted, what, 30 something days? Harrison, yes. Uh, you know, there were the, you know, the Tammany Hall folks. And, and, and so talk about some of our 45, because we're going to eventually come to 45, right. but I want to talk about some of the, his, his predecessors. The sea change in the presidency, I think, <clears throat> comes with the election of Andrew Jackson. Now, the predecessors to Andrew Jackson, 
uh, Washington, and then uh, John Adams, and uh, Jefferson, and Madison, Monroe, and even John Quincy Adams, were all... The Adams were all from this area? Well, they're all Easterners. Yes. They all came from the eastern side of the Appalachians. They were all uh, well-read, and in some instances, very well-educated. Uh, they were all, I guess, as you would define them in the early 19th century, as gentlemen. Okay. And then along comes Andrew Jackson, <laughs> who clearly everyone recognizes as not a gentleman, hardly. He comes from the West. He's pretty rough. He's pretty crude. And he's very democratic with a small d. It is Jackson who makes the presidency into this popular figure and creates this environment in which democratic reforms begin to really take place, uh, in, certainly in the western states and in the east. So Andrew Jackson introduces, the, he's, he's a tidal wave, a tsunami that comes in. Uh, and he really does change the, na the nature of the presidency. So he is, to me, one of the really important figures in the history of, uh, of the institution of the president. And he was number seven, just yeah. so I can just yeah. uh, for our right, viewing right. audience, he was our seventh president. Right. And so after Jackson, uh, the other presidents follow somewhat in this tradition of reaching out to a populace. Uh, Washington uh, and uh, John Adams and, and Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, John Quincy Adams uh, were not great politicians in the sense they didn't go out on the huskings, you know, they, they weren't doing the campaign trail. Jackson does the campaign trail and introduces this sort of drama, uh, in this sort of emotion into the presidency. Uh, so he, I think, ranks, and of course, we can argue, not argue, certainly would agree on the importance of Washington and Jefferson, but I'm just pointing out that Jackson is kind of this turning point. Uh, and I think certainly, and I think everyone would agree, Lincoln uh, stands as, as one of the greatest, uh, perhaps second only in, in terms of how you rank, rank these people. I, always difficult to rank anyone, but sure. second to Washington probably. So uh, The other figure that comes to mind in terms of uh, changing the dynamics of the presidency is Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, because here is Theodore Roosevelt, a, the youngest president okay, at, at that moment, the youngest president elected. He's a man who seems to have unbounded energy, <laughs> much to the horror, by the way, of the uh, regular Republicans. When uh, McKinley died, uh, they, uh, of course, Roosevelt had been McKinley's vice president. The Republicans made Roosevelt vice president because they thought that was a good way to get rid of him. Okay? They, wanted to, they wanted to get rid of Roosevelt right. because he was a pain to the party. When McKinley dies, Mark Hanner, the great Republican organizer, is supposed to have exclaimed, Oh, my God, that damned cowboy is in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so Roosevelt then brings in this level of energy, this populist urge, uh, and again, popularizes the president. He takes the role of the president to new heights in terms of, of leadership. Uh, so, I, so I think of those three men in our past that really did change and alter the nature of the presidency. Just for, again, for, just for information from folks, we talk about, you know, uh, Roosevelt became president when McKinley was assassinated. Right, right, uh, right. You know, we, you know, and you oftentimes hear about Ulysses S. Grant in yes, terms of yeah. his role. You yeah. hear about Woodrow Wilson yes. in terms of many types of issues, right. uh, some positive, some yes, negative. Yes. And I suspect yes. that that was true depending upon your vantage point in terms of uh, uh, with respect to the policies that one put in place. Uh, but as we come forward, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, for myself, um, I would say I was old enough to be aware of Eisenhower. Yes. Um, I certainly was more aware of John F. Kennedy. Mm -hmm was very much aware of, because I was by that time coming into uh, the, my high school years and uh, moving on into my college years right. of Lyndon Johnson's uh, presidency. L let's talk about that period of time, because we come out of, well, let's go back a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to FDR, because there were a lot transpired in that period of time in the presidents that had to serve and the changes in many communities. For instance, prior to, you know, we can go back to Reconstruction and what that meant in terms of the, you know, the Deep South. Right. The Democrats were different in terms of perception, particularly as it did from the black community who were Republicans up mm -hmm, until mm -hmm, the time of mm -hmm. Theodore Roosevelt, mm -hmm. excuse me, of Franklin Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. 
But Franklin Roosevelt and, and the issues around the depression and, 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 uh, and, and the war and all of that, can we talk a little bit from FDR forward or start at any point you want, but if you at least there, if we could just have a little conversation around those. What happened, one of the most important transitions that happened under the leadership of Franklin around Delano Roosevelt was that we began to assume and to recognize or to assign to the federal government a responsibility for the prosperity of the nation. Uh, that had not been the case before Roosevelt. Uh, no one thought that uh, Washington or Jackson or Lincoln was responsible for the unemployment rate or responsible for the growth of the national product or any of that. Roosevelt, of course, comes into the presidency at a time when an extraordinary economic national crisis. And he assumes the mantle of responsibility for the process of restoring the prosperity of America. That becomes fundamental. That is still with us today. We today see the federal government as the principal player. Did we not just go through a tax measure and that was pushed through based upon what? That it would help the economy. So Roosevelt did that. He put the federal government squarely in responsibility for national prosperity. A big change. Wasn't at a time also when Social Security professor so, came out of that, you know, uh, the welfare system. Precisely. All of those things precisely. came out during that time frame. The idea that the federal government had a responsibility to see to the welfare and good being of its citizens. And you're right, Social Security is certainly part of that. Began that trend, which certainly has continued. The federal government may back, backtrack occasionally. But the fact of the matter is, it moves forward in terms of helping American citizens achieve prosperity. Uh, the other great change that came in the period, not during Roosevelt, but in the post-war period, was the issue of civil rights. Uh, certainly sparked in great measure uh, by Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954, which deemed segregation, which had been legal, uh, deemed segregation illegal. The case of Brown versus the Board of Education introduced in testimony, as you probably well know, sociological evidence which previously hadn't really been introduced in, in law cases. We began to see the great harm that had been done of slavery and the harm that had continued past Reconstruction well into the 20th century. And so as we became more aware of that and sensitive to that, this gave birth to the Civil Rights Movement, which was fundamental uh, to changing the way we view our nation and view one another. So that was a phenomenal change, which was to some degree embraced by Harry Truman, who desegregated the armed forces, uh, and certainly was embraced in a dramatic way uh, by Lyndon Johnson uh, following the death of President Kennedy with the Voting Rights Act, a phenomenal achievement there, I think, which we still move forward on. Civil Rights Act of 64, right. Voting Rights Act, Civil exactly. Rights Act of 68. Uh, you know, and that's interesting as folks will look yeah. at uh, the, uh, the presidency of Lyndon Johnson, they would be amazed to find out it, and even how he was able to get these, yes. uh, uh, this yes, very tense right. legislation through the right. South because he was from Texas. Uh, he was a former speaker in the, the Nine Yards. And those of us who study the civil rights era f certainly understand and appreciate, if you will, the courageousness <laughs> of Lyndon Johnson so in terms he, of the legislation. So here you have this presidency that now emerges as the spokesperson for prosperity. Okay? And now the president who is our leader in civil rights and seeing equal rights for all Americans. Very important in shaping the presidency. And then there's a third element that comes in. And two, we can trace this back to Franklin Roosevelt, what Arthur Schlesinger Jr. called the imperial presidency. Mm -hmm. In that because of our place in the world, which emerged in the 20th century, because of our power, our, our armed forces, the president is, after all, commander in chief. And so the president emerges as this powerful figure who commands this military, uh, this imperial president, who is not completely free to do anything he wishes, that's not the case, but indeed he has great power. So I, I would identify these three developments in the latter part of the 20th century that really changed the presidency, this point where the president is our champion for prosperity, uh, where the president is our champion for equal rights, for the rights of all Americans, and the president as this very powerful commander in chief. That's a good stopping point for uh, for us to 
go to our sponsors because I want to come back and now have us leap forward to the present time, uh, talk about all of those themes because what you just talked about, taking the leadership, the power, and talk about it in light of what's happening presently with respect to 45's use of that power of the presidency. Uh, and if we have an opportunity of time for Mitch, we'll talk a little bit about this whole presidential privilege, pardon, mm -hmm. and, and the like. So we're going to give our sponsors, and we'll be right back. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Maxie's Delicatessen. That's at 117 Sharon Street in Stoughton. They're 781-341-1662. American Cancer Society, yes, they're looking for volunteers, drive cancer patients to and from their treatments, 1-800-ACS-6662, or just go to www.cancer.org. Ilsa Marks Food Pantry in St. Anthony's Free Market, 2 Park Avenue in Stoughton. For more information, call Christine Gallagher, that's at 781-341-0611, or 781-341-0549. Meals on Wheels, just ask for Jessica. You'll find her at 781-344-8882, extension 2. Stoughton Penny Saver, our business is advertising your business, they tell us. 27 Rose Glen Street, Stoughton, 781-344-4833. Community Forum Showtimes in Stoughton. It's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at 6 p.m., Monday at 8 p.m., Tuesday at 5 p.m., it's on Comcast Channel 9 and Verizon Channel 28. All comments and suggestions welcome. Contact us at communityforum1 at yahoo.com. Samaritans, they're at 41 West Street in the fourth floor in Boston, 02111. Their phone number is 617-536-2460. 24-hour helplines for Samaritans. And the number is 877-870-HOPE. That's 877-870-HOPE. 4673. Samaritans, you can find them at 800 252 teen. That's 252 8336. Or find them online at SamaritansHope.org. Get Fresh, Stoughton's own cooking show. New episodes coming soon Comcast Channel 9, Verizon Channel 28. And you can view Get Fresh on Mondays at 5.30 p.m., Wednesdays at 8 p.m., Thursdays at 9 a.m., Fridays at 5 o'clock p.m. The Hometown Business Show, great show for you to watch, and you can see it on Tuesdays at 11 a.m., Wednesdays at 5.30 p.m., Thursdays at 8 p.m., Sundays at 7 p.m. on Comcast Channel 9, Verizon Channel 28. The new show on SMAC, but it's not so new because it's uh, been around for a couple of months now, but we like to consider it new because they're not old like Community Forum. So we are united for a healthy Stoughton. You can view this program on Mondays at 5 p.m., Tuesdays at 9 a.m., Wednesdays at 8.30 p.m., Fridays at 11 a.m., again on Comcast Channel 9 and Verizon Channel 28. Monday Night Bingo at Avatora Congregation, 1179 Central Street in Stoughton. Come on out, you're supporting a good congregation, having fun, seeing your friends, getting those uh, great numbers, those great cards. The doors open at 4.30 p.m. The games start at 6.30 p.m. Come out, support them, and have fun. Well, Professor, we're back, and uh, as I, we said before we went to break, that we would chat about, uh, about the, what has become the power of the presidency, in, in, in many cases the entire executive branch, and then we want to look at it through the lens of what is going on now with the current President 45. Talk to us about, uh, as you see, the progression of the power syndrome, if you will, in the presidency of the United States. The president has a, the presidency uh, has, over the last several decades, assumed tremendous power. Uh, it, by default, it hasn't been an example of the president seizing power. Uh, 
nor has it been an example of the Congress uh, in some legislative fashion deferring or giving power to the president. Uh, but the presidency has assumed this enormous influence that it has now. Uh, an influence which, if not overriding the Congress, he, he cannot do that, nonetheless seems to challenge the Congress. And I think unfortunately, and this goes for both parties by the way, that the Congress has been unwilling uh, to challenge the presidency and in that unwillingness the default mechanism has been to increase the power of the institution uh, to which we see it now. I often think when I hear about executive orders and I guess there are a lot of them Joe, I wonder uh, how Washington would view these. I'll have to check. I wonder how many executive orders George Washington issued. Mm -hmm. uh, I doubt that he issued any. And so that's an example of where this power has just expanded and expanded. Uh, much, I think, uh, would be to the consternation of the Founding Fathers. I was, you know, the reason what I was reaching for is because I have this book, How Our Laws Are Made. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> you yes. Know, and when, yes. No, the young folks would go to their right. phone, I got to go to right. the book, but, you know, we know that the, law, the laws don't originate in the presidency. No, they do not. <laughs> you know? They do not. Uh, in fact, in the early days of the presidency, it was unusual for the president to instigate a law or to suggest a law. Today, uh, a large proportion, a large proportion of the laws that are enacted by Congress come from the White House and are sent up to Capitol Hill and then th put through the process of, of enactment. That would have been entirely alien to the early presidents. They did not see themselves as the legislator. They saw that as the power of the Congress. Today, we see the president as the great legislator. When he gives his State of the Union address, he usually lays out what his legislative agenda is. That would have been strange to uh, Thomas Jefferson or to uh, George Washington. They would not have understood that. They would have left that to the Congress. So the presidency has indeed assumed enormous powers, which it now exercises today. I want to just digress for a minute. I want to stay on the presidency, but mm. I just have to get this point out and, and get your take on it. Um, my position is that uh, Donald Trump has, has effectively been able to create a third party. <laughs> In my view, there's the Democrats, the Republican, and the Trumpites. I know there was the two-party system, Democrats and, and, and Republicans. Can you talk about that to let people understand how we came into the, the two-party system? Well, originally, uh, the Founding Fathers, and this was a bit naive on their part, uh, they did not uh, anticipate or foresee the rise of political parties. Of course, they arose rather quickly uh, by the mid, by the late 1790s. There were clearly two views upon uh, the role of the national government. Uh, one side being the Federalists, as they were called, uh, led by Hamilton, uh, who generally viewed, uh, wanted a stronger central government, and so an active federal go uh, central government. Uh, the other side uh, we refer to as the Democratic Republicans, led by Thomas Jefferson. Uh, they were a party who saw less power for the central government. They were also more oriented towards an agrarian America, whereas the Federalists were more oriented towards a more business urban America. Uh, gradually, over time, these two strains evolve and, and develop in the course of the 19th century, uh, so that by uh, this time of the Civil War, it is just before the Civil War that the Republican Party emerges, takes its form, which it still has today, as the opposition party to the Democratic Party. And so it's by mid-19th century, certainly by the Civil War, that we have two very discernible political parties, the, Demo party, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. And those are the parties that we have today. Uh, the base of support has shifted. Uh, the Democratic Party originally was very strong in the South. That was their base of support. Republicans very strong in the North. Uh, in the 20th century, those party bases shift somewhat as what we now see them today. Uh, the blue, the red states, the term that we now use, uh, have this geographic orientation which has shifted and changed. Uh, but so now we have two parties. We have had third parties in the past, uh, in the 19th century, the Populist Party, for example. Uh, the, the way our electoral system is set up, it kind of uh, is not uh, favorable to third parties. Uh, so third parties have appeared, they then tend to disappear and their membership sifts over into the two principal parties. Uh, but I do take your point today that we do seem to have at least uh, two, two, two parties. We have the Democratic organized political parties. And then we have this third group, not organized necessarily, uh, but clearly people, 
a significant number of people who share uh, a sentiment. I would describe their sentiment as anti-government. I think that the sentiment which they share is a negative sentiment. I don't know that they have a positive view. It seems to me they have a very negative view. Uh, but nonetheless, you're right, there is this third element uh, in our political system now uh, that our uh, adherence to uh, are very favorable towards President Trump. Our time is, uh, as always, would uh, uh, you know when I have such a, a great and distinguished <laughs> and intellectual guest as you, um, on uh, the time seems to just melt away. Uh, but I want to talk about what is at least in the discussion. We have the, the things we talk about uh, in some of the discourse that's going on now between the legislature. Mm -hmm. We have all these mm -hmm. investigations by the House and the mm -hmm. Senate in terms of their, their committees. We have the special prosecutor in terms of Mueller uh, uh, is looking at certain things. We hear executive privilege being bantered around. Mm -hmm. We hear, well, there would be pardons if things were to occur in order, which the president can do pardons, and there are some limitations to it, but not much as far as on the federal level. Can we talk about it, uh, and I'll just throw in on the pardon piece, because I've read some of right. this. Can pardon on federal crimes, yes. but not on state crimes. That is correct. So can we talk about correct. those to the extent we can? Executive privilege right. in terms of pardons and anything along the lines that, that folds into that belly work. Well, you're absolutely right, Joe. The President of the United States has the power to pardon, but only for federal offenses. He cannot pardon for state offenses, which, of course, I, th I think leaves people in a bit of a quandary because uh, even if particular individuals were indicted and charged and convicted uh, of uh, federal crimes, there's nothing to say that they could not be charged in state court uh, for similar kind of offenses. And so I do think that the power of the pardon that the president has does have that limitation. Uh, so I think that the president, whoever the president is, needs to be careful about how he decides to use that power. And that's in the Constitution. Oh, yes. That power no, there is, is the no question. There is no question that the president has the power to pardon those convicted in federal court. There is no question of that at all. Nor is there any question that he does not have the power to pardon people convicted in state courts. So people charged of crimes may uh, be pardoned in one venue, but they're at risk in the other venue. So it's not a, in, a, in, the, in our balanced system, in our federal system, it is a balanced system, and so there are various venues, which is a good thing that we have this division of power. Yes. Anything, uh, can we, you know, to the extent that you are aware of the specifics on this, this whole discussion around executive privilege, uh, is that, that's, that's more a term of art. I don't think that that's a, constitu or is it a constitutional, no, it, it, that's more or less a practice, a term of art, something that came up in, ter the, in this, when you talked about in terms of yeah. the presidential powers uh, that have emerged. How did executive privilege come about? Well, it is a term of art, mm -hmm. and I think the courts are still in the process of deciding what, what that art is. To what degree does it extend? Uh, obviously, some people would want to have it to extend to any conversation at all, apparently, that the President of the United States has with anyone on any topic, and that's simply that's silly. Uh, so it is a matter that is a duty. It's not in the Constitution. There is no article, there is no section uh, that says anything about executive privilege, none at all. Uh, it does come down, I think, and the courts probably have reviewed it as this, as this separation of powers. That is to say, uh, what right does the Congress or, or the judiciary have to intrude into the matters under the purview of the president? I think that is the fundamental question. I don't know that there's a fine line there, Joe. I think that this is a line that each court is going to have to decide, and maybe we're going to that again, as we have in the past, in the current environment. Uh, a new court, which we have now, a court that is not the same as the one in years previous, might decide differently. But you're right, it is a term of art. It's not a con the president has no constitutional right uh, to deny information uh, to the judiciary or to the Congress. Uh, it is a matter to, to be decided by the courts. I said at the opening, I talked about the fact that, in at least in my adult lifetime, um, and as a student of politics, I have never seen a, a, a so much discussion around the presidential office almost 24-7. Uh, 
Um, do we attribute that to uh, what 45 is doing? Or can we attribute it to the fact that we have a whole new social media uh, uh, construct that's going on? What's your take as a, as, as a student of the history of, of the presidency, of, of politics, What's your take on what's going on now? You, I mean, you cannot, every day it's a new story. <laughs> it is the way the current president handles the institution of the presidency. Uh, and I think that for a variety of reasons, and here I'm not making a political statement, but for a variety of reasons, the obsessive attention that we now pay to the presidency because of the nature of the person in the presidency and the way he behaves as president is harmful to the institution. Uh, I'm leaving aside, however we may debate and discuss, what President Trump does or does not do, whether we agree or not agree. I just think the volume of attention to this institution is harmful to it. And I look forward to the moment when we can have a succession, a successor president that is less involved in all of this social media. My hope is that anger can create a political movement. We know that. But anger can't sustain that movement. And my hope is that as we move forward, the anger that we have will dissipate, will come, will reduce. That's my hope. And that we can come back to a more, and I'll say normal, some people will say it's a terrible word, but a more normal presidency. But I do think that the manner in which the current president manages the presidency, manages the office, is harmful to the dignity and status of that office. If you were invited down to have a conversation, now I'm going to shift to the other branch, the one who is in Article, uh, Article 1, Section 1, <laughs> the legislative branch, what would you say to the legislative leaders in the dynamics? It seems to me that they are abdicating their role and that's what I'm viewing over the past year, uh, they're abdicating their role to what 45 wishes to do in his administration. Now, not much has gone on legislatively and otherwise, but the, if you, maybe it's the perception, maybe it's my viewpoint, but that's how I see it. If you agree with that assessment, what conversation would you have with the legislative leaders trying to uh, imbue in them what their role and responsibilities are? I think I <clears throat> would like to suggest to them they might want to grow a spine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> legislators, because there are always a number of them, can hide behind one another. Okay? There are 100 senators, and any senator could say, I didn't make that decision, I didn't make that decision, 435 members of the House, okay? I didn't make that, I was only one of 100 votes, or 150 votes, whatever it happens to be. They have to get away from that. They have to stand up, they have to stand up as representatives and articulate their position, and it requires leadership. The leadership of the House, Republican and Democratic, on both sides of the, of the chamber, both chambers need to come together. Maybe they do this in private. I think that Paul Ryan and Senator Mitchell, I think that the House leadership, Republican and Democratic, the Senate, I think they can solve this if they will come together. M requires compromise. It means standing up to certain members on both parties, extreme members, and saying we can't do that, we won't do that. If they can come together in the legislature, and confront the president, let me take that back, not confront the president, okay? Work with the president. I think the president, as we have seen, seems to be malleable enough, then it can be worked out. But I do believe, I do believe, no matter how we might like to blame the White House, that the fault we are in is in our legislative chambers because they have lost the element of courageous leadership. I know where this program will air probably after we've had a decision as to whether our uh, federal government will, will be funded. Uh, we're, we're, it'll, you know, we're a day before that decision is to be made. Prognosis on what the outcome might be on the, uh, whether we'll get a funding bill or an extension. We have a situation where the Republican Party uh, occupies uh, all three, basically Correct. all three branches of government. Correct. 
uh, but certainly in terms of both chambers of the legislature and as well as the presidency, obviously the judiciary doesn't vote in this situation. Right. Any prognosis as to what that will be? Well, if history is any lesson, Joe, they will default. They will default to a some sort of continuing resolution and a promise to deal with this within the next 30 days. And 30 days from now, Joe? Well, they'll... <laughs> They, now, some are saying that they're not going to allow for the default. There's some that, are, you know, because that, that, that's what they're talking about in terms of the two weeks. And yes. if they don't have it in 30 days, I think what you're prompting me to say, they'll default again. <laughs> I don't know. And in the meantime, what makes this particular situation, unlike the previous ones that we have faced, there are real victims here, Joe. What's the number? 700,000? 800,000? of young people who are in great peril. Yes. Great peril. You talk so about this the DACA. Isn't, this isn't a matter that you and I won't yeah. be able to visit the National Park, Joe, okay? Right. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about 800,000 young people who we need in this country who are in peril. Well, I just hope that uh, uh, that within this conversation that they uh, that they will address that, but we're coming to the close, Professor. I just want to say thank you so much. I, uh, you've given me more on this program than I could even <laughs> have imagined uh, with your knowledge and, um, and your forthrightness, for sure. And it's evident that's why you're a professor emeritus uh, at our great university. And I wish you all the best. I, as you, as I said before, if there's any way I can come on the uh, <laughs> on the cruises with you, uh, just give me a call. But again, thank you so much for joining me here today. Well, Joe, it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much.